Good morning. It is wonderful to see you all today and welcome to this, which is one of a series of occasional lectures that are offered at Waterloo Seminary uh, as a means of uh, challenging and informing us and inviting us to a deeper conversation and consideration of uh, this world of which we are a part, our place in it, and particularly how it uh, impacts us as people of faith. Uh, just a few housekeeping things. There are, uh, there's lots of coffee out here, and you are welcome to bring it in, so if you even need a, a refill uh, during uh, the lecture, please feel free to help yourselves. And for those of you who need them, washrooms are straight down the hall and to the left at the end of the hall. Today we are both pleased and honored to welcome Dr. Lemma Degaffa uh, to Waterloo Lutheran Seminary. Dr. Degaffa was born and raised in Ethiopia. He earned a BA in public administration from Addis Ababa University and a PhD in human resource management development, which was jointly awarded by Trinity Seminary in Columbus, Ohio and the University of Liverpool in the UK. His doctoral dissertation was entitled, The Role of Leadership in Managing Rural Community Change, the Ugandan Experience. Over the last 35 years, uh, Dr. Degama has garnered a wealth of experience in the area of community development, primarily in East and South Africa. He began his career as a project director on the national staff of the, of the Lutheran World Federation in Ethiopia, overseeing a number of returnee and community rehabilitation projects. From there, he went on to work as a program officer, deputy director, and country director, respectively, for the LWF programs in Zambia and Malwe. From 1997 to 2007, he worked for the Lutheran World Federation in Geneva as the regional program officer for Eastern Africa and the Great Lakes region with thematic responsibility for human resource development. He has conducted numerous workshops on team building, project management, conflict management, emotional intelligence and leadership for NGO directors, program coordinators, project managers, and community development staff in South and East Africa. He is currently the Lutheran World Federation's resident representative for the Ethiopia program. On a personal note, earlier this year, I was part of a small delegation that spent a week with Dr. Degaffa making our way over the bumpy and sometimes nerve-wracking roads of the Ethiopian highlands and the vast arid expanses of the Great Rift Valley just west of the Somali border. Our delegation from Canadian Lutheran World Relief was visiting a number of community development projects which are sponsored by the Lutheran World Federation. They ranged from building schools to providing wells to improving agricultural practices and supporting gender equity. And in each and every one of those settings, promoting community development and increasing the community's capacity to identify its own needs and respond in ways that improved the life and well-being of the whole community was of paramount importance. And time and again, it was unmistakably evident that Dr. Degaffa's gentle yet empowering leadership was a crucial element in setting the tone and the direction for this important work. Please join me today in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Lama Degaffa. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Um, it's a long CV. I, I don't deserve some of this, but I, I cannot also hide the fact that I've had a long experience. Um, and I am thrilled to be here to share some of these experiences with you. Uh, I have uh, brought with me uh, slides. As per Mark's 
direction to talk to you about a little bit of East Africa, the general politics and the challenges in Eastern Africa, and also what the churches are doing, especially in Ethiopia. So this will be my presentation there. I want to say that um, I connect with you in, in very many ways. I trained in Trinity Seminary, and also I, I taught in a, a seminary back home. Uh, that's not mentioned here. Um, this seminary co is called Ethiopian Evangelical, uh, Ethiopian Graduates uh, Theological Seminary. Yeah. So that's that's one, and um, I've been also lecturing in other other institutions. So uh, this this area, this place of education, uh, makes me feel uh, at home. So I'm glad to be part of you today. I have to learn how this technology works. So uh, is it just that I press? All right, like I said earlier, we will start with <clears throat> um, with a little bit of political scene in, in Eastern Africa. Uh, some people call this area that, that uh, have uh, all these five, six countries as Greater Horn. If we go outside of uh, the, you go into Uganda and Tanzania, Tanzania that's called Greater Horn. But the, other, the others without Tanzania and Uganda are called uh, the Horn of Africa. We sometimes think because of so many problems in this part of the world, we say the horn has to be cut off so that they don't, don't have conflicts and fighting between them. So if you just look at, uh, I don't know if I can use this in this manner. Um, if we can just make a round of these countries, and I can talk to you a little bit about each one, each one of them. Um, Sudan is, is a place of um, uh, many opportunities, many resources, as you know. Oil is a big resource, but also a place of conflict as a result of these riches. There has been North and South conflict, and now the conflict in Darfur although there has been a separation between north and south, the conflict has not still um, gone away, as a result of which there are thousands and thousands of displaced people and also refugees uh, coming out into the neighboring countries. I'll talk to, uh, to you about the refugees later on. So Sudan is a country that has not solved the problem yet and uh, is suffering from what has been created for the last two decades. Moving to uh, Kenya a bit, Kenya is one of uh, uh, the successful countries in the region, uh, a very stable country for many years, but as of the last election where there has been a, a very um, bloody conflict between parties and many people died and displaced, that has destabilized that country and this issue is not resolved. Every time election comes, there is, there is fear and um, um, uncertainty, and there is one coming soon. So there are always uh, serious problems in that place also. And as we go into Somalia, Somalia is a nation that has not seen peace since independence over the last two decades. The Siadbari government was, uh, if you know this history, was uh, one government that has had a big uh, vision of getting part of Ethiopia in the 70s, the Ogaden part, this part. And that was not without reason. It was because the colonial powers earlier has already put that into the minds of the Somalis that this, this part belongs to you. Although there was grazing between nomads, you know, the pastoralist community in this area in Somali. So with that, um, the, the Siadbari government had five stars on their, and on their um, flag, which meant part of that flag is part of Ethiopia, and part was in Djibouti, and uh, the rest was Somalia. 
So in order to fill those stars, own those stars, they waged war, war in the late 70s, 78, 79. I was in the country at that time. A very huge war. They had spent millions of uh, dollars on it. The Russians had equipped them at the time. But just in the middle of the course of the war, the Russians thought now Ethiopia has turned communist. They should also back up the communist government in Ethiopia. So they brought all their um, weapon to Ethiopia. And uh, we, we had to uh, get rid of the Somalis who partly uh, invaded this, this um, part of the country. Because of that war, the Somalis did not cover from the, um, the loss, so to say, the loss in, in um, property, in, in direction, and, and so forth. So Siad Bari had to lose. And I think the source of Somalis' problem today emanates from what the decision they had made at the time of that invasion over 20, 30 years ago. Um, so you have in Somalia now uh, anarchy, there's no government, there is no system, there's no structure, and on top of that, the Al-Qaeda version of Somalia called Al-Shabaab is operating very actively, destabilizing the country and also creating a lot of displacement and refugees in, in that country. <coughs> I'll talk to you about the refugees later on, but let me just say that Somali had to be divided into two. Somaliland, uh, called Puntland, and Somalia as, as a result of all this crisis. Djibouti is okay. It's a small country. They don't, uh, don't need travel. They don't want travel. Uh, the French government is helping the, the Djibouti government, so there's no much problem. But coming to Eritrea a little bit, Eritrea was part of Ethiopia, as, as many of you know. They got independence in 1990 um, or 91. Um, that was very painful for, for both, pa both population, those who are not interested in politics, but interested in just relationship because People were living peacefully together, Ethiopians and Eritreans, but that division had really cut um, that relationship into two. Um, it was a darling of the many nations. It was uh, supported by many governments when it was independent. It was also a promising state at the beginning, you know, lots of enthusiasm, inspiration to change things around, and in, in fact to become the Singapore of Africa where they would be taking a lot of materials from the neighboring countries, manufacture them, and, and send them back uh, to, to these countries, sell, sell, and in that way dominant, dom dominate the region. That did not happen. The reverse happened, government crisis, political crisis, and we have a very serious situation in Eritrea now where majority of people are running out, those who have even come back with enthusiasm to support uh, their, their government are leaving, lots of imprisonment, and also refugees, some of them coming to Ethiopia. So um, what I want to just say is Ethiopia is surrounded by nations that have political problems and that has also implications on what Ethiopia uh, can do and should do. Um, Ethiopia itself was a stable country politically, uh, although there is no Ethiopia, as you know, in politics there's no best conditions. But the prime minister, the late prime minister, who just passed away last month, his government was very, very strong and very ambitious also to get Ethiopia into a world, a world group, as you may say. So there has been a lot of developments in the country. In fact, uh, the GDP uh, was in the, in the double figures, I think 10 to 12% every year for the last eight years. 
Uh, there's a booming economy and booming infrastructure development and all that. Uh, we are, the nation is, is, is mourning, still mourning the days of the prime minister. Uh, but there has been stable transition, very, very stable pr transition. We have a new uh, prime minister right now. This prime minister is unique in a way, has never had that kind of prime minister before because a lot of positions have been from the, the uh, different religious background and ethnic background in the past. But this person now in power comes from a Protestant background. He is also from the minority um, uh, ethnic background as well as political system. His party is a very small party. So that's uh, what we have in Ethiopia. Let me just go back into the refugee situation I talked to, to you about. Sudan is, uh, because of the turmoil, has a lot of uh, people leaving the country, so we are dealing with a lot of refugees on this side of uh, Ethiopia. Um, that is, even now as we speak, LWF is also dealing with about 38,000 Sudanese refugees only in this part. And there are some more over here, uh, another uh, 35,000 or so. Uh, because of the Somali situation, we also have a lot of refugees. In Kenya, about half a million in a place called uh, Dol, uh, Dadab, sorry, in Kenya. And then in Ethiopia, a place called Dolo Ado. We have about 169, close to 170,000 refugees in that place. As we were driving here with, with Tom, I saw the, the population of Waterloo. It says 119,000. I, I just remembered the number of refugees in Dolo Ado, 170,000. So you can imagine the challenge this number brings. And when you have to provide everything, you have to provide food, education, health, water, even firewood you have to provide to each family. So that's, that's a big challenge, really. And uh, that's what we are grappling with in this um, part. We have also a small refugee population somewhere here in the east. It's, uh, it's also Somali population, about 24,000 of them that LWF deals with. I want to say also from the Eritrean side, there are uh, close to 61,000 refugees uh, in Ethiopia. Most of them high school kids, youth, also those who have run away from military uh, conscription, uh, young, young people and military people also. Uh, simply they just don't like to be part of um, the current government system. Okay, so that brings us into um, what the region looks like. It may not be inclusive, it may not be comprehensive, but if you have questions, we can get back to it, and I will move on to the churches um, and other developments. Okay, so what I covered in this is just uh, the conflict in Sudan, the consequences, uh, the problems that are not resolved, probably I didn't say that. Um, Sudan, now the issue of oil, is not resolved because the oil field is in southern Sudan and the refinery is in northern Sudan. So how to share this border and how to share the resources uh, that's, uh, uh, that's uh, f coming from the oil is not resolved there. Uh, the prime minister, the former prime minister was uh, helping in this negotiation. That stopped for a while. Now they have resumed the negotiation. There are other issues like uh, date, the date that they had as Sudan, as one Sudan, how to share that between north and south. The third issue is there are many nationalities mixed now, north, southern Sudanese in the north in Khartoum, and then northern Sudanese in Juba. So how these two uh, can go back or if they stay their citizenship is, is an issue of discussion. The borderline, 
between the south and the north is not clear because there are oil fields in between. So that is also not cleared, and these are issues of very contentious nature, and that can lead to war. If that war breaks up, it has almost in, in about two months ago, but it's resolved because of a place called Abiyeh. Abiyeh is the biggest oil field in Sudan, and when the referendum was run for southern Sudan, it was, it was considered as um, a separate referendum for Abiyeh to choose south or north, but that did not take place, so that's still a problem postponed. Right, religious extremism in, in uh, Somalia, I did speak about that, and then the rest I think I have, I have covered. <clears throat> Okay, just to talk a little bit about the role of churches. Now I'm, I'm, I'm coming from general to specific. So this one is a discussion on role of churches in Ethiopia. There are three major churches. One is the Orthodox Church, Coptic Church, the biggest, 40% uh, of the total population. And then we have the, Cat the uh, Catholic, about half a million and the Protestants about 15 million. Um, yeah, these three are very critical apart from the Muslim um, the religion. Well, they have these churches as, uh, as a, a joint effort have played a great role in peace and reconciliation in Ethiopia. They have been trying to reconcile even Eritrea and Ethiopia. Inside the country, they played a great role in um, helping the government to pardon the opposition party about a year ago because the, the party members were, were imprisoned. So that happened, the, the release happened because of the intervention of the churches. I think Mellas, the late prime minister, was very appreciative of the way they have mediated this process. Apart from that, the, the, all the churches have uh, a, lo a role of role in emergency response because Ethiopia is so vulnerable to drought and the effects of drought. Each of these, these um, church uh, units have their emergency units to deal with uh, uh, drought and other conflict nature. Uh, responses. Poverty is a big issue in, in Ethiopia in particular, and um, the, the, the um, churches have, ha have their own development offices to deal with poverty in a small way. It's, it's a big country to cover everything, but I think uh, they have a major role to play there. Just to take a specific church role in Ethiopia, I have picked up what LWF, the Lutheran World Federation, in conjunction with the ECMY, the Evangelical Lutheran Church uh, Mechanic Jesus, that's a local Lutheran church in Ethiopia, it, the, what we're doing uh, in this country uh, as LWF. The history goes back to uh, the 1970s, 21-72, when LWF was invited by the then church president called Ato Emmanuel. He was a minister, a government minister, and also president of the church at the time. Uh, so he invited LWF to work in Ethiopia. Uh, the program started with responding with, uh, uh, to emergencies, responding to uh, the drought at that time. And the program has been evolving since then, from relief to uh, rehabilitation, to development. I joined this office in 1977 as I graduated from, from college. Uh, I was invited by the, by the, the at the time, uh, the representative was uh, a lady Norwegian who knew me in another program in a in church, in a Norwegian church aid. So, so she invited me to work with her. I worked uh, for the Federation for seven years at the time as project coordinator that was mentioned by Mark maybe earlier. 
and then left in 84. So I knew uh, exactly what the program was doing uh, even at those early, uh, those early days. And um, since 19, 1985, this program has been moving in a big way to development activities. I want to say most of this work were also a contribution from CLWR, CFGB in this country. And I want to say a big thank you for being part of Ethiopia, for saving Ethiopians at the time of such crisis. Um, so what you see here is the efforts that uh, uh, CLWR and CFGB also uh, contributed uh, to, towards the improvement, uh, betterment of people. This is just, just to show you what Ethiopia looks like today in, uh, when it's not uh, yet, you know, some, some development work is not done because there is a lot of degrading of um, the soil, uh, a lot of uh, vegetation has been cut down simply because people want to survive and in the process of survival, surviving, they have hurt the, the vegetation, they have hurt nature, nature has kicked back and we'll see the, the effects in, in this way, just to show you what it looks like. Um, and these are some of the results. Because of all these interference, uh, human interference with the environment, the environment has been cut down and climate change combined, uh, lots of rivers have dried up in Ethiopia. It's not only rivers, uh, even lakes, lakes have dried up. So if you have heard about the effects of climate change, it has been already evidenced in Ethiopia. That is what we see here. And combination of climate change and also a wrong use of land and all that have resulted in drought in Ethiopia, towards which we have responded uh, to s sustain life. So what you see here is um, a distribution of food to millions of people at the time, actually. Just an example of food distribution to, um, to help people survive. I have here, well, a lot of people have died as a result of the um, drought and famine in the 70s. You probably know uh, this, this part. But although we could not redeem the previous generation, we think we can redeem the future generation, which is the, the kids now. And how we can do that is by, of course, uh, dealing with the land, because that's where we have start to start, and that's where life is, and, and all the living is, uh, the, the possibility for la living is. And um, See, I want, to, I want you to compare. This is the kind of uh, position that a lot of our uh, mountains are so um, um, lost their vegetation, and we want to recover them in this way. Also part of the recovery program with this soil bond and terraces. Also stop the wash the, the, the soil that are being washed away by flood, reduce the speed of water in, the, in these uh, small rivers that are dry. Because they are so dry and the, sat, the sun has beaten the soil, it has, the soil has crumbled. And when heavy rain comes, it just washes the soil away. So the best way probably is to to reduce uh, through this mechanism, just a similar one. And also we do uh, some tree planting, afforestation as it's called. But the biggest job we did over the last 20, 25 years is what we call soil water
conservation and also dam construction. So this is bringing the human resource, the human resource that was idle, I showed you, I showed you earlier, who just come to receive food and go home. We thought it's better they do something for the future, and that is a combination of technology and human labor, and so also uh, some machinery, and the result is construction of dams, reservation of water, so that we bring the the the, uh, the table the water table up, we use it for uh, animal um, drinking, and also use some of this for irrigation. There are several of them, and I I only have a sample here. So that's the result of bringing people together and resources put together. We have. Some of these dams look like lakes, you know, you know uh, artificial lakes. So they are they are big and very helpful to the surrounding. This one too. Some of these lakes can also can be used for recreation, and maybe tourism. Right. So that was on, on dams, but we also uh, got into uh, food production. Earlier we were providing food, giving food out, handouts out. We thought that is, is no, it would not take us anywhere. It's just developing what we call dependency syndrome. In fact, people got so dependent on these foods, food supply, they they even did not want to work. They, they just, just would wait for the food to come. And uh, funny enough, sometimes when we had food for work uh, and they have to do some planting trees, they plant the trees in, during the daytime and go and pull them out in the evenings. Why? Because their food for work will stop if those trees grow. They want to keep on getting food by you know planting these, you know these are just uh, some of the things we we felt this is dangerous for the future, if we continue to provide food. So we have to get on to production. How did we do that? Uh, sorry. That is um, again put people into work to produce local material like this crushed stone. We don't have to bring machinery when we have so many people. So they would do the crushing in readiness for some masonry work to bring water, divert rivers for irrigation. So what you see here is a river somewhere here brought into uh, a plain land for irrigation. Ethiopia is a mountainous country. You need a lot of structure, good structures to, to get this work. And Lutron World Federation was and still remains the first organization to have started this program, these river diversions and small scale irrigations in Ethiopia on a big scale. Neither government nor other agencies have done this and we, uh, we feel proud about that. So these are different um, river diversions. Now, These are coming now down to, to the, the plateau, to, to flat land from wherever they, they were trapped, the rivers were diverted. Some places the community is involved in repairs and, and this is the result of those river diversions, food production on a big scale. Actually, uh, I'll show you the statistics and in part, some part of um, where these, these uh, activities are, the communities have surplus to sell to the markets, to supply hotels and so forth. So it has been even surplus for sale. You can see uh, food has been available to the community that had no food before. Families are happy. Fruit trees are also sold for, uh, to earn some money. 
people would come and watch, uh, um, look and learn from these experiences because that was the only uh, place to learn from, LWF work at the time. Just statistical information, during the 80s and 90s, LWF was able to uh, work on 110 river diversions in a couple of places I mentioned here, and about 15 dams, big dams like you saw earlier. Uh, these are records in the country. It's, uh, it's not done before, and the uh, only experience uh, came from LWF. I have appreciated those who have done it because after I came back to the office and I put uh, all these records together just in recognition of those who have done it also to show to the world that uh, those of you who have pro uh, contributed uh, to Ethiopia, I mean, uh, this is, this is the, the result and a rewarding result. So about 90,000 households have benefited the population of over half a million people that used to get handouts, never get handouts after, after this work. So you can also see the hectare that was uh, used for irrigation, but this was the starting point and it has increased after uh, LWF left the place. We made a small survey. After 20 years, what does, what does the irrigation scheme, the river diversion we built 20 years ago look like? And this was one of them. I, this, this is done during my time two years ago. A place called Billa Small Irrigation Project. And it was, it was done in 86. So this was, um, this was, surveyed, uh, we did the research in 2000, uh, 2010. It was 150 hectares at the time of construction and supporting 200 families. But this has, the land is now as it is when we did in 2010, this survey was increased to 612 hectares from 100 and 50. The family living on it has also increased twofold. You can say from 200 families, it's uh, 511 families. Government has put in three development agents. Uh, the place has now electricity, it has a clinic, it has school, telephone. So development has uh, taken place after our intervention and we are very happy to be the pioneers, to be the, the starting point for the development of this community. They supply with um, products, uh, a place called Dredo is one of the big towns in nearby 50 kilometers ago. Wholesalers come and buy from this place. And in terms of cash, what this project costed at the time was only $58 thousand dollars but of course there was also food uh, grain for food for work so you can imagine with small money 58,000 what we can do and what um, also incremental um, factor that it has okay just now Ethiopia uh, in Ethiopia LWF is working in many many areas. Um, I think it's just enough to have an impression of what we're doing where, like the refugee program here in Dolo Addo, another refugee program with the Sudanese here. Also, uh, there is a refugee program here. But the other programs are what we call ICDPs. ICDP means Integrated Community Development projects. So um, that's the, the overall picture of LWF intervention in Ethiopia. And I'll give you just a, a few of what we do in terms of uh, our strategy in the, 
uh, current strategy, we emphasize on food security, also natural resource development, which is the climate change I talked about. We also have emergency response as, as ongoing. And then we emphasize on community capacity building, to build the, the leadership capacity of people, to empower women, and, and uh, to help them to stand on their two feet when also when LWF leaves. So that's very critical and cross-cutting issues like um, HIV, AIDS, gender issues, and so forth. Okay, it's going to detail, maybe for just, just for your interest, what we call ICDP, Integrated Community Development Projects, contain as a package these, these activities, agriculture, natural resource, water, health, education, genders, and so forth. I want to talk to you about this COLTA. COLTA is Community um, Organization and Leadership Training for Action. That is the approach we use for capacity building. And uh, I'm proud to mention to you that it has really enhanced um, uh, community confidence and also women involvement in, in decision making and managing their work. So that's how it worked, this Kolta sitting and speaking with people. This man was a visitor at the time. He's from Church of Sweden. So he was interested in what was going on. So as part of this um, community empowerment, especially for women, we provide the women with small loans, whatever they're interest, they are interested in. You can see this, this woman was interested in getting some poultry. So we give them four uh, chicks and one cock. So the eggs they get from these would be sold, maybe one, uh, one dollar or two dollars, and that's an addition to her income. Very mean, very small, but still significant in their lives. This lady went, opted for uh, raising sheep, that's what she has, and this one went for um, goat, she has something from the goat. And this woman went for a shop. She's very keen on putting up a shop. She's a thriving lady through that. And this is another successful woman in raising um, a sheep. This family went. Uh, actually, this is a higher level. It's only when they have succeeded with the goat and the sheep, we say, OK, now you can graduate into, into having a bigger loan. <laughs> so yeah. It's all relative. So that is what they have opted for, and they have it. And uh, the, the, the cow has given to, uh, birth to a calf. Another group want to go for beehive. We encourage them to do that. So that's a higher level now. It's what we call cooperative level. They work together in a group of 15, 10, and so forth. And also a little bit of technology. You know, this, this area used to trash their maize with hand, you know, whatever they produced, they had to do it with hand. And this is a maize, what do you call it? This, uh, there's a name for it, I forgot, but anyway, it's it just maize uh, sheller. Yeah, I think it's a maize sheller. <clears throat> it's a small, humble school. We also get into education, like I said earlier, community-built uh, school, and then we have an improved school. Uh, that was what they used to be in the, the older one. This is the bigger, uh, bit improved school. With the community participation, again, they bring in the stones, the sand, whatever is possible for the uh, material available in their areas. This is the inside of the, the school, the classroom. At the time of our visit, there was no school. It was a Sunday, I think. so. We put in one of the program staff there to sit. And a small clinic in the area, mainly to educate the uh, community on health and help them with small uh, cases. And if it's a bigger case, to refer them to bigger hospitals. Government provides the school teachers as well as the health staff and the medicine. So that's the same thing. 
We also uh, provide them with clean water. This is, this is what we call uh, spring protection. Up in the mountain, we protect the spring, and then the spring comes down the hill, and that's a distribution point. With that, we have to also establish a cattle trough because these communities are so associated with their cows, cattle, they cannot be without it. Whatever they get, their cows have to get, so we, we um, do construct troughs. This is in the Somali area. That's a very difficult area to get water. You have to dip over 250 meters. Even then, you don't get water, so the deep, deep borehole. So what we have opted is you, we just changed their technology of putting a pond into putting, um, they call it birka. We put that uh, in concrete, and that's how the rivers are accumulated, and then they use it from here. Because of lack of water, they used to wander from one place to another place with their cattle. But now that moving from one place to another has reduced because they have water for several months. And what that meant is they can now send their children to school because of this permanence in one place. So their children are, are lucky in that way. Okay, so that was what uh, looks like in the communities. Maybe I, I'll give you a, just a snapshot of the Dolo a refugee program. It's, uh, this is what a refugee um, camp looks like, just a part of it. So if you have a helicopter view, you can see massive, massive area. Uh, but they all live in tents. And the population is humongous. It's, it's very, very big, the majority of which are young people and children. Over 68% of the community members are young people. So you can see a lot of them have missed education because they have gone, their ages have gone to 15, 16 because of the war in Somalia. Now there's a catch up on adult education for them, also school construction for new ones, for young, young school age kids. Water is a very, very crucial um, element. Uh, so there is never enough water. Now we, have, we were providing about 13 liters per person. The standard is 20 liters. We have moved to 70 liters. Just now we have reached 20 liters per person because we had to drill a lot of wells. Initially we were providing them with trucks from somewhere, getting water with trucks to the community. Yes, firewood is a serious problem. And in an area where there is no wood, there is no trees, that's even worse. So the refugees, one, they need it for cooking. Two, they want to make some money, some little money. And that's how uh, there is devastation. It's all cutting, but not planting. So we're involved in environmental protection and development too. You can see just, just an example of how uh, the, the environment suffers where there are big population above the capacity of the environment. Can refugees be productive? Yes, given the opportunity, but they don't have land. All their piece of land is maybe 10 by 10 for their house and for whatever they can do. So we improvised some kind of production system called MSG, uh, multi, um, yes, Mark, multi-story gardening. Yeah. So what we do is we just uh, put sacks in so soil into sacks, and then they can put in lettuce, onion, whatever, potatoes. That's how they. They do gardening. Some of them are really successful. They have managed to get some, some produce for their home use, as well as for their some sale also, but not in a big, on a big scale. This is one of the garden in their homestead, 
humble as, as it is, but still productive. Do we also provide them with some poultry? The, the size of poultry they can keep is just about this. We give them five. If they manage to buy their own, it can go up to 10. That's a big number in that area. That's a sizable number. OK, this is a futuristic program. That's the last one. Uh, I didn't ask what time I have uh, in my <laughs> Um, for this presentation, but I hope you still have time. I'll just rush through. Uh, this was a project funded by ECHO, uh, the European Union. They gave us for what's called food security, so community involvement is very important, and that was to produce food in an area where food is scarce, very scarce. Did you visit the Lalibala area? That's the area. So uh, that area is a very, very um, um, affected area by the dr drought. And most people died from that area as a result of famine in the early 70s and mid 80s. So we are, we are really happy to, to be able to bring in new technology, call it technology in, in quotation, and that is river di diversions and irrigation scheme, small irrigation. So it goes, this is the field, about 62 uh, hectares of land is under irrigation in this area. You can see what they're doing. Their land is not fertile, lots of stones, but still it's possible, with water it's possible to do anything, even miracles. So you can see these people are able to sell their produce to the next market, the next city around them. Again, back to Ethiopia and the degradation of land. This was the most beautiful mountain with green trees on it 30, 40, 50 years ago. But overuse and exhaustion has led to uh, total, the, the land is shaved almost. It's, it's like it is completely um, um, utilized. And it looks like for a new generation as if it was created like that. Secondly, it also looks like it doesn't grow trees. This is, this is a cursed land that does not grow like the way a new generation think. But it's not. It's, uh, although it is overused and utilized and mismanaged, it is still a productive area. And, and I want to show you how we proved that. So we started working on terraces. And of course, we put up the nurseries with um, three seedlings that grow in that area, indigenous ones. And we started planting those trees with the community uh, participation. You can see how it started, uh, like uh, uh, this is three years ago. And today, the land is covered with all uh, the different green, green trees and leaves because it's no longer uh, interfered. It's protected now. It's a closed area. No cattle, no nothing moves into it. And people have learned from their past experience. And I've also noticed that, after all, their land can grow trees. You know, this is something is very interesting. It's, it's shocking sometimes, because they have told us, don't don't take trouble. Our land does not grow trees. You know, they're telling us that we don't have to really take trouble to do anything there. So it's a proof to them and proof to us it's possible to do miracles, quote unquote. So this is that very land you saw that was barren, just to show you different, different one. Uh, and we only allowed the communities to cut grass and feed their cattle instead of roaming in a free range 
grazing. And they agreed to that. So they even get money from the grass they, they cut from this one. I think the last record I have is about 58,000 burr. 58,000 burr is somewhere like 4,000, 5,000 dollars. So that is income, a uh, source of income, plus the, the, the land is healing itself, helping the land to heal itself. Two years. These trees are only two years. When our general secretary from Geneva came to Ethiopia a year ago, uh, we had a visit with uh, the late prime minister um, with him, and I was there. The prime minister was very eager about um, making a difference in the country, especially on poverty and also environment. And I told, told him, this is what I do, and that we have proved it's possible to reverse what has happened. And he said, yes, I've also proved that, and we are on the same page. So unfortunately, he's not there and to see this, but um, we are really happy that it's possible, that we've proved it's possible to reverse anywhere, I think, for that matter. So just to so show you different uh, different possibilities. Okay, just to show you um, a statistical, those of you who love to see things through numbers, um, this is what LWF Ethiopia program spent over the last uh, about 20 years, maybe, 20, yeah, over 20 years. You can see in the 80s up to 85, the amount of money, some of this is in food, but calculated in cash. So the, the big years, like 86, 85 was a drought year, very heavy drought year. A lot of people were affected, that's why we have big money there. But eventually it was going down in the 90s, mid 90s, it has gone down, gone down a lot because we have changed strategy here. Our strategy was from capital expenditure to spending a lot on people, like small scale uh, loans, like you saw women empowerment and all that. And uh, so I joined in the best again. I left here, I was in Zambia, Geneva. Then I came back in 2008, joined in 2009. Since then we have had operational budgets like that with all the refugee work I mentioned to you. And in 2012, our budget is about the same, uh, about $10,000, $12,000, 12 million, I mean, million dollars a year. Okay. Thank you very much. That was very appreciated that you could listen to me. Did you ask a question? Yeah, sure. Right, okay, let's go from uh, right to left, maybe from left to right, I, I respect age. <laughs>
I haven't got the place right, maybe, but um, you are asking about the refugees, big refugee camp in the 80s, you said? On the Juba River. Okay, uh, Juba River is in Sudan, if I'm not mistaken, but a similar situation that refugees who came to Ethiopia about that time, uh, there were over 25, thousand of them, a lot of them returned, except 3,000 that remained in Ethiopia. Those who didn't want to go back and didn't feel that it's home for them anymore because refugees are not forced to go back, so they stayed in, in Eastern Ethiopia, are now joined by another wave of refugees after the war in the Blue Nile. So. Uh, we still deal with, with some of them. But Sudanese don't want to stay in a foreign country, by the way. If things work out for them, they go back. So even now, if situations change, a lot of them will go back. Mm. Yeah, some of these things, I was not born at that time, <laughs> meaning, <laughs> meaning I don't have record of those, but uh, Sudanese refugees back and forth is always there. Uh, I think even from, from Kenya, like a place called Kakuma, a lot of refugees went back to Sudan and then back again. What holds the Sudanese from going back is education for their children. They love education for their children. If the schools are good in the camps, they would rather stay and suffer for their children than go back where their children will not get education. So that's a clue probably for your question, but mm, some of them I don't have really facts. Yes, there are some introductions of fuel saving stoves to save some of the firewood, but that was not possible to cope up because the, the burning is so uh, so huge, high, uh, that even the so-called fuel-saving uh, stoves did not uh, save much. And then there was an introduction of kerosene that is, uh, that is still working, but the frequency of supplies is not then, there because kerosene comes from outside. Uh, so uh, there is... Uh, there's a big challenge around this, this uh, firewood, and communities like that would not live without it. Uh, but the option now is for kerosene and a little bit of solar, which has not been successful. Solar energy has not been successful because the kind of cooking they have is not simple cooking like we have here. They have to do a big pot uh, for porridge, and you need to have a, a very solid um, uh, store for it, and the solars don't don't provide that. Yeah, very small. Right, I'll come back to you. Yes, the churches, like I mentioned earlier, uh, do have this joint effort uh, for peace and reconciliation in Ethiopia. It's not very effective, I must admit, uh, because they're also busy you know, on their own other things that, that they have to do. Uh, 
but they have, they have done a major work, I must say. Like I, sh I mentioned earlier, they have approached the government to uh, get uh, the opposition party released. Also in conflict situations, tribal conflicts, they have been very effective. Uh, from what I know a little bit, they are also uh, connected with this cont continental peace, peace initiatives uh, on a uh, bigger scale, uh, so that they, uh, they reinforce, they learn from one another. So in that way, I think there is, there is a, a good effort. I must say, though, the politics in this part of Africa does not give a lot of room for churches. You see that? It's not that their effort is not there, but the, the room that they have is very, very small. So they have to find their way uh, to really get things done. That is uh, the challenge. I think um, regardless, they are doing something that's sometimes visible. Ethiopia has a federal, yes. The political stability of Ethiopia. Well, thank you for giving us the credit. We're doing something, but not big, and it's, it's a very small uh, area we cover as uh, NGOs or faith-based organizations. But it's true, the government in Africa is not as effective as private organizations calling the NGOs as private organizations. Uh, it's bulky, you know, the government is bulky. They don't move fast, and action is, is not on time. Uh, but these small organizations can go in and just do uh, the change they want to bring about. So you cannot compare the two. Um, having said that, what we do is on a small scale. Uh, so we cannot cover the entire land, the entire country. Uh, with regards to Ethiopia, the government has been trying a lot. They have been really trying to uh, change the image, the profile that Ethiopia has, especially this poverty and famine profile, and they have put up a five-year plan, what they call growth and transformation plan, and they are very active to include, to be inclusive, uh, even asked churches and NGOs to be part of this plan in what we, we do. That is a credit to them to, to really mobilize resources together and channel, channel it for one purpose. But I am not only talking of Africa, in general, the uh, Ethiopia, I mean, in general, the African governments have yet to, um, to manage uh, the, the, the challenges that are in each country. It's, uh, it's a work in progress, but there are many, th many factors, a population factor, we have 80 million people, the second in Africa now. Others, other countries are growing fast, so there's no, the programs are not catching up with a growing population. Climate change, um, illiteracy, and all these factors cannot, um, um, you know, governments cannot do exactly how, the, how they can do it. I, I made my study in Uganda, as Mark mentioned earlier, and that's the only country that has reduced poverty by 20% for over a 10-year period from 85 to 95. And that was what caught my, my, my attention, and I said, how, how did they do it? How did this government do it, and what was the leadership role in that process? And I, my discovery was, was great, and that's what I use now back home in a small way. And that was because they had a, a transformation uh, 
leader, the, the Museveni at the time was very, very strong. He would go out to the villages and talk to people one to one. You know, he was not sitting in the office. He go to, goes to the colleges and educate young people. Now or never, you know, he tells them that you go out to do this and that. So he was very, very active, although he has overstayed his time and now it's a different story again. He didn't allow new people to come in uh, with new ideas. Mark, you have, you have somebody else with Yeah, I think you, yes. Right, um, this is a very uh, interesting question. The Muslim uh, group are very active definitely in that part of Africa, especially with Somalia now being the hub to, to expand from and, and destabilize the countries around uh, that region. I want to say one credit for Ethiopia, the security system is very, very strong. They have a very, very tight and networked security system. While there is a lot of problem in Dadaab, Dadaab is a Kenya uh, camp, there is no problem in the Dolo Addo, the Ethiopia camp today, because security is really tight and they, they monitor a lot. So that also goes in within the country. So the uprising uh, of the, Soma, the Islamist activities is curtailed, so to say. Although there are some, some elements here and there, you probably have heard they burnt a lot of churches in, in uh, West Africa, West Ethiopia, killed some people, but government intervened and got hold of all those people just in time and gave them the justice they deserve. Um, so your second question of how does a, how does a Protestant leader come to as such a prominence, hey, it's, uh, we don't know. <laughs> yes, sir. You look like an Ethiopian, are you? Thank you. So help me. Yes, she. I'll have to interpret that. My compatriot asked there, um, do you have a, an NGO policy in Ethiopia, NGO law it's, as it's called, has it affected you? How do you operate under this law? Yes, this law has been enacted about two years now. Um, it has been a very, uh, very tough law for many NGOs, especially dealing in human rights, women's rights, children's rights, advocacy, um, peace and reconciliation because these areas were reserved for government. That's the way it was put, that these are areas we will deal with. You guys don't have to bother about this. Just do your business of development, sectoral developments. That was one. And two, they also made a distinction between international and national NGOs. International NGOs are those whose income uh, comes from abroad 90%, 90% of their income. And those, only 10% from within. Even a local NGO whose income uh, source is abroad, that will be considered as international. So for those who are national, they get 90% of their income locally. The government allowed they can be involved in human rights and children's rights, all these uh, prohibited 
areas for internationals. So a lot of NGOs, those who are de dealing with children, with women's rights, with advocacy, suffered as a result. Some of them have packed up and gone. Others have minimized. Others have changed their sectors and continued. LWF is, um, it has a policy of right-based approach before. Uh, that's how one of its priorities are. And we negotiated with headquarters, listen, we don't have to have this brand, you know, right-based approach and this and that, but we can do the job without saying it, right? We can maintain the right to food, the right to education, the right to learning, the right to expression, whatever it is, without talking about it. So that was agreed between office and headquarters, and we changed all those statements and phrases from our strategy and submitted that to government because we have to submit to the agency all the plans we have. We were not affected except for feeling that we have, we have gone over our own words in terms of writing. But actually the doing, we're doing it and it's very effective. And also I must say, if you have a good rapport with the government and the local people, they usually don't monitor you. They don't really seriously look after you. The agencies they suspect, they are after that agency through agents and through security. So LWF is a friendly, friendly organization. We have always been uh, a proud for them, a pri pride, you call it. They have many times talked about, if you want to do a job, do it like LWF, both in the refugee and in the host community work. So in, in a way, they took us as models and never suspected us going against their law and never monitored us, we have no problem. Of course, with our budget, there is what they call 30-70, 30 for admin and 70 for program, that has to be always approved. And we are always according to the books, but this law might change now. Don't quote me, but it might change because there are, there are lots of discussions around it. Dr. Degaffa, Dr. Lemma, um, I want to uh, express gratitude, first of all, on behalf of those of us who have gathered here this morning and those who you will meet with over the course of your uh, week or so in Canada. Um, I think I know something of the, the great burden that you carry in your work in Ethiopia and uh, what a sacrifice it is uh, for you and also for your colleagues to take this time to be away. It's one of the burdens people in positions like yours carry. You need to be communicating with partners outside and, and yet it takes you away from your work at a time where I understand um, the presented needs that are before you uh, are moving faster than capacity to do the work. So you've uh, given us a great gift um, in coming here to Canada and, and communicating with us. Secondly, I want to thank you um, for the partnership that you express. You are our face and our hands and our feet in a very important piece of work that we claim to be part of our Christian vocation. And uh, it's wonderful to be able to express thanks to you for the way that you extend our ministry, where you help us to be more faithful in our discipleship. And we are truly grateful for that. It's good to see you again, Lama. And we wish you many blessings and much thanks. <laughs>